Praise the Lord. Let's, let's stand and see. It's probably been almost a year since we've had in service Bible study, so it's good to see those that couldn't make it. Praise the Lord. Give those the opportunity to find out where we're at. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and sing a song. Sister Ray's been so kind to uh, give us a Bible study this evening. Uh, and uh, there's a special request by uh, a lady that Sherry worked with, Sister Deb Anderson. She, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so she needs special prayer. Her mother needs special prayer. So, Deb, if you're watching this evening, uh, we're going to say a special prayer for you and your family. Uh, any unspoken requests? I know Sister Kim. Need some special prayer. So Sister Kim, we're going to pray for you. Sister Phillips, we're praying for you. Praise the Lord. Um, and those that are unable to be here, Sister Ron is. Sister Kelly and her family. Sister Kelly and her family. And uh, I hadn't seen Brother Cowan in our last couple of Sunday services, so let's remember him in prayer. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this evening that we got to be able to come and to praise you and worship you. I pray you move upon this service and Lord, you see the special request of Sister Kim, Lord, I pray that you touch her, move upon her body, Lord, heal her, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we pray for that right now, Lord, that you would move upon her, her family, God, pray that you move upon her, pray that you move upon her, pray that you move upon her, Sunday school at 11 o'clock and then worship service at 12 and then uh, next, uh, next Wednesday Bible study right here praise the Lord. I hear it's supposed to be getting cold though so uh, make sure you wear layers. Layer up Sister Fred. It's going to be cold. Uh, we get uh, a nice uh, familiar wake up call. We understand we live in Indiana. It's 100 degrees and then you Amen. Let's sing a song. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love.
Hallelujah. So glad he first loved me. Amen. Sister Ray, you can't come in. Give us the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Love the presence of the Lord that I feel. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good. I am not sick. I promise you, I am fine. But um, I get paid to talk. And I, I talk all day today. So if I need to stop and take a drink, just forgive me. <clears throat> These vocal cords have been used greatly. You get paid for each word? I get paid for each word, brother. I'm better. <laughs> You're a millionaire. I'm going to be. Jesus, man. All right. Uh, I promise you the scriptures that I cover are going to be familiar, but I'm hoping and praying in Jesus' name that I can deliver this to you all. As the Lord has been speaking to me over the last couple weeks. I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 22. Again, really very familiar passage. And we're going to read verses 36 through 40. Then we're going to go to John chapter 14. And we'll read a couple of verses there. Verses 15 and then verse 21. So starting with Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Master. Which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, y'all know this, you can quote this, you don't even necessarily need to look at your Bibles. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, then Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Turning over to John chapter 14, we're going to go down to verse 15, and then we're going to skip down to verse 21. Again, these are familiar verses to us. It's nothing unfamiliar. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments, verse 21, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So in Matthew, we've got this, what is this great command? And Jesus says, love God. Then he says, love others. And then you get to John 14, he says, if you love me, then just keep my commandments. My, my, my romantic heart went to How Do I Love Thee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. You might have studied it in school. If you were a hopeless romantic like I was, I loved this poem. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in writing to her dear husband, Robert Browning, said, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways I can use... I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need. By sun and candlelight, I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. That's just love, y'all. I love thee with the love I seem to lose when my, with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. I remember studying this poem in high school. And I, again, I was just a hopeless, terrible romantic. Um, it was right up my alley when we got to the poets in, in English. And, Oh, the romance that surrounded that poem. How it just made me long to have somebody to love like that. See how it worked out for me, right? <laughs> uh, how it made me long to have somebody like that in my life. You know, those silly pitter patters of the heart, you know. Um, when you're young, silly and absolutely ignorant of the reality of life, which is where I was. But when you talk about this pitter-patter of the heart, this desire to love, Blaise Pascal wrote about man's deepest desires. And this is what he said. 
What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once a man in a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. It's where we get the phrase, a God-shaped hole. Blaise Pascal is the one that came up with that concept. Now, I don't know about you, although I think that you're probably going to be with me when I say that this has been an amazing challenge going on over the last year. It's been an amazing challenge, and I'm going to face it tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about those challenges. I don't know about you, but for me, quarantine has sequestered us to such a point that at times, maybe, the emptiness of our lives was just palpable. We could feel it. What did we fill that emptiness we have a lot of time on our hands. Then the other question is, what are we still filling that emptiness with? Those to me, Pastor, are so great questions. Questions that I've had to ask myself and perhaps you have asked yourself as well. Going back to Matthew 22, where I first read in our text, if you read the beginning of Matthew 22, you see where Sadducees came to Jesus and they wanted to try to trick him into saying what they wanted him to say. And they were asking questions about the doctrine of resurrection. They put forth this crazy scenario and Jesus just shot them down. Because with wisdom, he could. So the Pharisees recognized what Jesus had done with the Sadducees and they said, oh, it's our turn. If the Sadducees couldn't get them, we're going to try to get them. And so they sent somebody who the scripture calls a lawyer, which really is somebody who studied and interpreted and taught the Mosaic Law. They were a lawyer. They're all about the law. That tried to trip up Jesus with that question that we read tonight. Jesus, master, what is the greatest commandment ever? Jesus' response to them was to get their love in order. Get it together, y'all, is really what he was saying. Love God first with everything you've got, then love everybody else around you. Simple, but profound. Short words, but huge impact. The verses that we read in John 14 tell us that if we love God, then we will keep his commandments. In other words, our love of God should equip us to fulfill what God asks of us. So then the obvious question is, how much do we love him? How much do we love him? Those are the questions that I have faced and perhaps you have faced over this last year. Did our love of God draw us closer to him? Did our love of God grow deeper over this last year because we had the time to invest in our love of God? God told Moses to have the Israelites purify themselves before God gave the commandments on Mount Sinai. And so in order to purify themselves, they had to wash themselves, they had to put on clean clothes, no extra ornaments, no jewelry, no nothing, just clean clothes and a clean body. The idea and the commandment really was be pure because you're getting ready to look God in the face. You're getting ready to have an encounter with the Most High. Be pure. Psalm 24, 3 through 5. This, I, I go over this a hundred times it seems in my mind. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul in the vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I'll never forget a message that I listened to, and it was not an apostolic minister, but man, that message impacted me. He was talking about Psalm 24, and he was talking about, you know, it's really easy if we think about it to have clean hands. We can wash those. We can control our actions if we have enough self-discipline. We can have clean hands when we come before the Lord. It's the pure heart that can get you. And, um, you know, when you're talking about a pure heart, now you're talking about your motives. What, what, what's really going on deep down inside of here? What it is what is it that motivates you? What, what are the thoughts of your mind, of your soul? Keeping our hearts pure is not the easiest job in the world. If y'all have figured out how to do it, aside from prayer and fasting, please let me know. Because I can't figure it out beyond that. Keeping a pure heart before the Lord. Now, i got to be real. Um, those of you that know me well, I absolutely despise washing dishes. I hate to wash dishes. Give me a toothbrush and take me to the dirtiest restroom you can find. And I would rather get on my hands and knees with a toothbrush cleaning that nasty restroom than to have to wash dishes. It's awful. Don't ask my sister about it. She has horror stories to tell you about me and you will never look at me again. Listen. But the fact of the matter is, is that dishes need to be washed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, paper plates. I've thought about it a few times. But what I tend to do, I'm going to confess. Confession is good for the soul, right? So I'm going to confess. Um, because I don't like to do dishes all that well, I tend to allow dishes to sit in my sink for a day or two. Well, that means that dirt gets stuck. Cheese. From my pizza chip. I hope nobody's fasting. Cheese from my pizza chicken that I made on Sunday that was just so good. And that I had my last portion today for lunch. Cheese is going to be stuck on that bowl. So that when I finally make myself do some dishes tomorrow, I'm going to have to scrub to get that cheese off of that dish. <laughs> have you ever done that? Have you ever let, don't confess, I'm the one confessing, it's all good. But what I have to do at times is if I allow food to get stuck on a plate, don't tell me to rinse it immediately, it doesn't work in my brain, I'm just saying now. When I have to do that, I have to scrub and scrub and scrub with soap and all that good jazz, and then I rinse it, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, Man, I didn't get it all. So you gotta scrub and scrub and scrub again. Anybody ever do that other than me? Don't confess. And if the food after all that scrubbing doesn't come off all that easily, then I get smart. And I say, if I soak this plate or this bowl or this pan, unless it's, you know, I'm getting off on tangents, but if I soak this bowl in some soapy water, and I let it sit for a while, that's going to work on the dirt. And that usually does the trick. But it's that washing and it's that cleansing, it's that, that scrubbing, and that's hard work, man. Just to get that dish clean. One of the most famous passages that I have heard taught and preached a thousand times probably in my short life Regarding repentance, you know it is Psalm 51. I go here because if we don't have our love of God right, then it's time to repent. How many times did Jesus say in the book of Revelation for the saints to repent to come back to their first love? Honestly, Psalm 51 is the heart of what the Lord has been speaking to me. And I promise you this is not going to be a condemning lesson, but I think we need to stop and look at some things. When there's heart issues, repentance will take care of it. Repentance will take care of the heart of the issue. So just allow me to share with you what the Lord has spoken to me. This 
psalm is the prayer of David after Nathan the prophet came to him and confronted him over his sin. Not just with Bathsheba, but actually having her husband killed. I mean, David did big stuff. Nathan the prophet confronts him about killing Uriah and taking Uriah's wife and how David covered up his sin. David, after being confronted, prays a prayer of repentance. And he begins Psalm 51 like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. David cries out for the mercy of God. The mercy to the God of tender mercies. I love that. David realizes that he's been caught. He realizes that he's been confronted and now he's got to do something about that confrontation. And so when he goes to God, it's not, oh God, go beat me up. It's God, you're the God that is tender. You're the God that is merciful, so please show me some of that mercy. It's not a condemning thing. It's relying on the mercy of God. David really knows that God's mercy is massive. So David doesn't just begin his prayer of repentance. He begins his prayer with worship. God, you are the most merciful one. I sin. Would you show me a portion? Of your mercy because one drop of mercy right. can take care of it all. David knew that. Verse 2 stood out to me a couple of weeks ago. Verse 2 Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I was struck. Not that David was repenting. We know this chapter. I read this chapter. Quite a bit, God, you know, because I know I'm human and I need help. But what I'm struck here with what David said was, God, I've asked for your mercy. Now I'm asking for you to cleanse me in a very specific way. How, God, do I want you to cleanse me? I wonder, um, I'm sure that I don't think Jeremiah and David were contemporaries, but Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful about all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Have you ever prayed the prayer like I did, and maybe not in these very words, because I am who I am, but often when I get to this part in Psalms, I, got, I say, God, cleanse every nook and cranny in my heart. In other words, those doors that I closed up, those things that I don't want to face, would you be merciful to me and get in there? And cleanse me. Um, and that is really exactly what David is praying here. God, go to the very depths of my soul. Even those secret places that I even don't know about. Because you know me better than I know me. God, go to the secret places and wash me. Cleanse me. Not partially, God, but completely. I love that. Because David doesn't just say, God, I had Uriah killed. God, I, I took a man's wife that I should not have taken. Lord, just cleanse those sins. No, he didn't say that. He said, God, I recognize my sin, but I also recognize that I'm human. So even those things that I don't even know are sin in my life, would you just completely wash me thoroughly? And that's really a good way of giving the prayer of repentance. God cleanse me and don't leave any part of my heart unclean. David continues, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I can almost hear David saying, yep, I did it. I was wrong. I cannot run away from it anymore. Against thee, the only verse four, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be cleared when thou judgest. David is continuing to acknowledge his sin 
And David comes to an absolute truth. If you listen really closely, you can almost hear David gasping. As the reality hits him, God, I didn't just do wrong against you, I. God, I didn't just do wrong against Abigail. God, I didn't just do wrong against the children of Israel that I'm trying to leave. Oh, God, I did wrong to you. I admit, I admit that so that others will know and understand you have every right to do to me whatever you're going to do to me. The truth of the matter is, is that when we sin, we ought to apologize to others if we've sinned against them, yes. But ultimately, we sin at the core against God. To me, that's the most sobering thought that can ever cross my mind. Verses 5 through 7. Behold, I was shaven in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with his oath. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than so. See, here is where I go to the whole scrub thing. Hyssop was an herb that grew along the walls, apparently. Um, it was a climbing herb. It had really long stems. The branches of, of the hyssop plant, from what I could tell, um, could be gathered together and used kind of like a brush for, for sprinkling. It was a symbol of purification. And honestly, this is really where I see the scrub brush of God coming along. David says, purge me with hyssop. Lord, would you take that scrub brush? Get into the nook and crannies of my heart. Scrub me up. Rinse me out. Until all you see is clean. And to me, that's hope. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I see hope running throughout all of Psalm 51. I know you're going, Sister Ray is off of her rocker. But, but, but listen, listen. In truth, the hope of God's mercy is, is what David is saying. God, don't just lightly brush over my sin. Cleanse me thoroughly. God, I know your mercy is working on me. And in me right now, it is your mercy. It is your grace to me. Right. When I can come to you and I can say, God, I've sinned. And I know you're not going to beat me up, but you're certainly going to clean me up. Right. That's mercy. That's hope. I don't know if I'm ever going to look at Psalm 51 again the same because all I can see now is hope, the hope of God's mercy flowing through our repentance. Needing to humble ourselves before the Lord in repentance really can seem hard at the moment if you're stubborn like me. But none of you are stubborn. Y'all are wonderful. You're not proud. You're not hateful. You're not stubborn. You don't deal with any of those bad attitudes, you know. But sometimes when the Lord confronts you, it's just not easy. It's not easy when the Lord looks at me and says, Jan, you got a problem here. And I'm pointing to me, so I'm not pointing at you. Jan, you've got a problem here. You need to get it right with me. But oh, the mercy of God that he comes to us and confronts us. Right. It's his mercy. Oh, the joy of knowing that we can go to the God of mercy. We don't sin intentionally, but we no. do sin. We ought not to sin continuously, but there just might be sins that seem to constantly trip us up. That's where the writer said to lay aside every sin every weight that does so easily beset us. In other words, get it out of your life. Right. Repent. Sever yourself from that sin. Walk away. What? When we come to God humbly, He shows us His mercy. When we come to Him with a repentant heart, 
we can rest assured that God has heard us. Right. Did you catch that? When we come to him in repentance, God hasn't turned a deaf ear because it's God that brings us to repentance. And so when we come to him, we can rest assured that God hears our cry and will not only will, but ask forgiven our sin. I love 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 2, 1 through 2, basically says, if any man has sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's a propitiation for our sins. He, is, he takes care of the sins of the world that the world would just come to. Right. It's his mercy that flows through Psalm 51. Verses 8 through 12. David says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Here's what I always tend to pray. I generally skip verses 1 through 9. I'm not going to anymore. But generally when I begin to pray a prayer of repentance, I go straight to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Do you catch it? David realizes that when he goes to God in repentance, that there's going to be some joy after it was all said and done. It's going to be worth it. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Now don't read those words quickly because you know them so well. Do we have hope of God's mercy? You bet we do. Oh, thank God for his mercy. How quickly does God forgive? As soon as you begin to repent. Remember the story. When Nathan confronted David, Nathan comes in and says, basically he gives him the, the parable of the man who stole the sheep. You know the story. And David, or Nathan looks at David and says, you're the one that did it. And David immediately turns to repentance. Now, Nathan was ready with a, with a condemnation and a judgment coming from God. David, you're going to have to face some things. You're going to have to have some judgment coming upon him because God cannot allow this to go on in your life. But did you notice that David immediately begins to repent? He, he bows his head in repentance. And I love it. It's almost as if Nathan was getting ready to walk out of the throne room. And as soon as David goes, oh, God, I'm so sorry. God speaks to Nathan and immediately I can just see Nathan turn around and going, you're forgiven. God has said it's taken care of. You still have to have to punishment. Don't get me wrong. But God has forgiven your sin. It was immediate. So if repentance from a true, pure heart happens, and God immediately forgives us, then I found myself asking, why in the world do we even need this song? Right? Why would David take 19 verses and talk about repentance if is if all he should have said, repent from a pure heart, and God will forgive you. Why do we even need Psalm 51? One reason David was a musician. He just had to get it out of Psalm. Have you ever gone through something in your life? And uh, Sister Andrew, you told me uh, uh, what happened, I think it was last night. You know, there was a situation going on, and immediately a song came to you. Did that ever happen to anybody? Right. Yes. David was a musician. It, it turned into a song for him. He had to express himself through music. He had to tell about the mercy of God. Not only was David a musician, but he was a teacher. He was a leader. And so he wrote to express how he responded to God. So that others could learn how to respond to God. 
He wrote to give us a pattern of repentance and how to recognize God's mercy in allowing us to repent and how to receive that forgiveness and that mercy. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In other words, David is saying, godly sorrow, when God begins to work on your heart, when God begins to deal with you and speak to you, and you start going, oh, yeah, I'm guilty. That's godly sorrow that makes you turn to God and say, okay, I'm guilty. I'm wrong. Hmm. But we get to verse 13. I love this. David goes through all this repentance. He tells us, oh God, create me a clean heart. Oh God, renew with and purge me with this. He goes through, God, cleanse me thoroughly, completely. I love verse 13. Because David says, then. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. When? When will I do this? After I've come to you in repentance. After I've come to you and you've shown me mercy, God. After you've cleansed me, then I'm going to teach others about it. I'm going to tell others that yes, sin is wrong. I'm going to lovingly warn them that their sin is an offense to God. But I'm also going to express that God's going to show them mercy if they'll repent. Not a bad thing. And David said, I expect that people are going to receive the message because I've given it in the love and the mercy of God. And they're going to respond. And they're going to repent. I love that. See, David knew the freedom that repentance brings. And Psalm 51 is him making good on his promise. Lord, you cleanse me, so I want to tell others about it. That's why I wrote Psalm 51. Not just so he could express himself, but so that you and I could understand what our sin does to God, but what God does to us and to our sin. Two things should happen when God convicts us of sin in our lives. First, we should repent. And then second, we should share the lessons we've learned with others. Now, I know what you're thinking. I am not about to tell Sister Ray the dirty bell of details of my sin. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. You don't have to tell everybody every little single thing that you did. But after God has convicted us and has led us to repentance, then it becomes easier to help others through their difficult times. And perhaps lovingly say, and, and a friend of mine and I talked um, the other day, I was like, you know, Friend, I won't call this person by name. But, but friend, perhaps you just need to, to, to pray through that and just let that go. There was no condemning in my voice. It was just, I love you. I want you to have a good relationship with the Lord. I want you to see God's mercy. So maybe it might be a good time. This might be a really good chance for you to say, Lord, I'm sorry. We can say we just didn't do whatever well. But God showed me mercy. Here's some pitfalls that perhaps I fell into, but maybe, just maybe the lessons that I learned can help you avoid them. That's what that's about. David continues in verses 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness, O Lord. Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. God, not only am I going to teach others how to respond to you, but I'm also going to respond to you in worship. You ever had one of those prayer meetings where the Lord had been convicting you about something and dealing with you about something, and you, you knew that you had gotten it all under the blood? Oh, the joy that floods your soul when you know that God has touched you, when you know that God has cleansed you from that sin, it should erupt in worship. It should erupt in praise. Oh, God, you're so great. You're so good. I, I did something wrong, but you washed me now so I can worship you because you've shown me your mercy. 
like some praise and worship that happens. Right. And I don't know about you, but when God shows me that kind of mercy, I go to the song that we started tonight. Falling in love with Jesus. Oh, I'm falling in love with Jesus.
your point. I think it was God's way of trying to get us to make sure our love was pure. To make sure our hearts were pure with our Father. Would you stand, please?
In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Don't forget Sunday service, Sunday school at 11 o'clock, Sunday worship at noon. Can't wait to see y'all again. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.